Welcome to Rising Woman Leaders. I'm your host, Meredith Rahm, and I believe the time has come for women to share their gifts, their voice, and their stories. I love seeing women spiritually and financially empowered, thriving in their life's work, and doing what they love every day. I've gathered a community of women living their dreams to tell us their stories and inspire us to step into more courage, self-love, and feminine leadership. If you like this podcast, use the hashtag Rising Woman Leaders. Follow me on Instagram at Meredith Rom and sign up for email updates at risingwomanleaders.com to get all the new and inspiring content. Now get cozy with a journal and a cup of tea. I hope you enjoy today's show. I'm here today with Mercedes Kirkle. She is an award winning author and channel for Mary Magdalene. In 2010, Mary Magdalene began coming to Mercedes Daily, giving extraordinary messages for humanity's spiritual growth. These messages became two best-selling books. The first book, titled Mary Magdalene Beckons, describes how to live in your heart and unite your feminine and masculine. The second book, titled Sublime Union, contains Mary's instruction on sacred sexuality, along with Mercedes' fascinating story of engaging the practices with her partner. Thank you so much for being here, Mercedes. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, I was reading your books. I first began Mary Magdalene Beckins a few months ago, but I actually went to India over the holidays, and I was traveling in India um, in the South. And there was one week I had where I was... Uh, in a little cottage and I was actually spending more time alone my last week of my time there and I just like was curled up with this book every day and just loving every word and I turn the page and I just be like inside after inside like oh my god (laughs) just so much the teachings they're, they're very simple and yet profound and I just want to to start off with thanking you for doing this work and sharing all that you have shared with so many. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> my great joy to do this. Yeah. So my first question is just about being a channel. And I'm curious, when was the first time you realized you had those capabilities? What was that like for you? How did you eventually like learn to strengthen and work with that ability? Mm-hmm. I like that question because over time I've realized that I had this ability in some ways long before I realized. Um, but it took me a long time to realize it. And then there was it coming in more too. So it was both. But um, I'm, I'm a person who's always had unusual phenomena their, all, their whole life, uh, experiences, spiritual experiences. But um, I didn't think that I could channel. And what that meant to me was um, that I could be a choice when I would get a message from spirit, that I could set up an appointment with the client and say, I'm going to channel at a certain time as opposed to it just happened randomly and I never knew when it was going to happen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the other thing is that I wanted to be able to get messages that were more than just for me. I had gotten very personal messages for myself, but um, I wanted to be able to receive messages for others and even for humanity, you know, universal messages. So, when this became clear to me, I was living in Hawaii, and um, I started getting the feeling that my life was about to change and that I was going to be doing very specific spiritual work, and it was going to involve channeling, and I felt like I didn't know how, and so I started praying, and I prayed every day for nine months that I would be given whatever I needed. If this is what I was meant to do, I was open to, you know, hearing a no, (laughs) but if it was that I would be given whatever I needed to do it. And um, during this time, I 
uh, got the message that I was to leave the big island of Hawaii. And I did not like this message because I had lived in Hawaii for 10 years, thought I was going to live there for the rest of my life. And so I checked it out three times to see if I was hearing the right message. And it was the same all three times. And so I decided to follow it because I had seen from so many experiences in the past that I was never misled the guidance always led me to the best outcome, even if I didn't think that was the case. <laughs> yeah. So I left the big island. It didn't say where to go, and I didn't know where to go, so I went to visit my family on the mainland and um, ended up spending about four months with my family. They were needing some assistance, and I was really glad I was able to offer that. And during that time, I um, periodically would ask, okay, spirit, where's my home now? Where am I supposed to be? And I got absolutely nothing. But I thought, okay, well, I know what I'm supposed to be doing right now. I'm supposed to be helping my family. And as soon as I had completed everything that I could think of that needed to be done for my family, I started getting guidance again. And I got guided to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And as soon as I got there, the red carpet just rolled out for me. Everything I needed was given to me, including a place to live with a woman who was a professional psychic. <laughs> wow. And um, I told her how I wanted to channel, and did she have any suggestions for me? And she said, well, do you meditate? And I said, I meditated for years. And then uh, I went through an awakening and felt like I was complete with meditation at that point. And... So I didn't, I hadn't for many years, but I said, I certainly know how. And she said, well, it can be helpful sometimes. You have to have a really clear mind to be able to channel. So I said, okay. So the next morning I sat down and meditated. And as soon as I did, I felt this really strong presence at my throat. And I felt like something was trying to come through, something very benign and wonderful. And I felt like it was stuck and I was blocking it, <laughs> which was probably my fear. Yeah. And, um, but I really wanted it to come through. So I just put all my intention on releasing whatever blockage and obstruction was in me to this energy coming through. And all of a sudden, a voice started speaking through me out loud, obviously very different from my own voice. And I, at the same moment, I got the internal communication that this was the voice of Mary Magdalene. Mm. And she proceeded to give a phenomenal um, discourse, a, a complete spiritual discourse, which is now the first uh, message in Mary Magdalene Beckins, the book. And um, I was blown away. I, and I was just dissolved. I was so amazed at what was coming through plus I was feeling her energy which was absolutely sublime incredible and by the time she finished I was just in a puddle <laughs> and and then I had a thought when the thought was I'm not going to remember this and that was completely unacceptable to me because I felt like a miracle had just occurred something like the sighting of Mother Mary at Lourdes, something along mm -hmm. like that big. And I, and I felt like this wasn't just for me. I was being, you know, trusted to share this with others. So I immediately asked her if I could go get my computer and if she would give me the message again so I could type it into my computer because I'm a fast typist. And she said, yes. And I went and got my computer, and she gave me the entire message again, absolutely identical, word for word, to the first time. <laughs> and that, to me, was the second miracle. And in some ways, for me, it was so significant because I knew that I couldn't have recreated that message in the state I was in at the, by the time I had finished hearing it the first time. And... So it was very validating for me that this was real and that I wasn't just making it up. And then she proceeded from there to come to me every day for over the course of a month. And very quickly I realized she was downloading a book, chapter by chapter, and in perfect form. And that's what became the book Mary Magdalene Beckins. Wow. Thank you for that story. Yeah. 
<laughs> I love how the piece around your intention and praying every day for nine months, such dedication, and then the meditation, finding that clarity, opening the channel, and then really intending, like, how can I remove this throat chakra block? <laughs> wow. Wow. And your guidance, do, do you feel like moving to New Mexico was part of opening as a channel? It was, it was many things. There were many parts to it, uh, I feel, in retrospect. Part of it was so that I would have the support that I needed to, to learn how to write a book and publish a book. I self-published. And I felt very strongly that this had to be a very professional book because I was bringing forth Mary Magdalene's teaching. Yes. So I wanted it to be at the level of any book that would be published, you know, by an established publisher. Yes. So um, I had access to that in Santa Fe, and I wouldn't have had that had I stayed in Hawaii, I don't think. Wow. So I think that was a big part of yeah. you know, preparing me for what I needed to to be able to um, do this next piece of work, which was felt to me huge. Yeah. Yeah, before you even knew what your mission, what your... Uh, yeah, what you were meant to do. Yeah. I didn't know, but spirit knew. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm yeah. curious if you, what was your relationship to Mary Magdalene before having this chan first channeled message? I didn't have a relationship. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't really have a relationship to Yeshua, who's the same as Jesus. Yeshua is the Aramaic name for Jesus. And she always calls him Yeshua. So that's what I always call him. Except that when I was 12 years old, I had a series of visions of remembering having been with Yeshua in the desert. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw the, his feet. I saw the desert. There was a, a group of about 100 people who were following him, and I was part of that group. Um, there was an inner group, and I was not part of the inner group. And, um, and I remember seeing the love and devotion that people held him in, like feeling that. But my family was Jewish, and I didn't think they would understand that I was what was happening, and I didn't know anyone else to tell, so I never told anyone about these visions, and they eventually receded. And it wasn't until much, much later that I remembered that it even happened. Wow. But at the time I started channeling, I had virtually no, and I think that was intentional. I think I was shielded so that I would be um, tabla rasa, blank slate. I wouldn't be influenced by other ideas about Mary Magdalene. And, you know, it was only later that I even learned that other people were channeling her or that there were so mm. many books about her. I thought I was the only one because I didn't know about any of that. Yeah. <laughs> Powerful. That's really beautiful that you were just, yeah, this open slate to come in and because you didn't have any real associations with her, you got to just receive her messages very purely. Yes. Um, I would love to now just hear about the essence of Mary's teachings. Like if you were, what would you, what does she, what were these messages? What was, what did she first have to share with you? In her very first message, she kind of summarized everything she wanted to share. And then everything else from there was breaking it down and explaining it and, and more fully. She was just brilliant the way she gave me the book. It was in classic form where she had like the thesis statement, which was the first chapter, and then you know, <laughs> explaining it all and you know letting it build through all the other chapters and then summarizing at the end. It was amazing. But... Um, she said right off the bat that um, the, the fundamental teaching is about uniting the masculine and feminine. And that um, she has waited 2,000 years for humanity to be ready to hear this teaching. That it was there at the time that she incarnated with Yeshua. And they both knew that humanity was not ready. And that's why her part of the teaching and her story was 
suppressed as best as possible, as best the authorities could suppress it for 2,000 years. You know, mm-hmm. casting her as a prostitute and writing her out of the Bible, virtually, you know, anything about her. And um, that they knew that it, we were... It, we had to, to we had work to do humanity until we were ready to start to be open to the feminine and this is the time now and it's like she's bursting through now and part of what I discovered after I had this experience and she started coming to me was how many people she's coming to at, mm-hmm. that it's huge and it's um, it's like she's never been able to be squelched even though you know I feel like the religious organization institution of the church tried to marginalize and write her out it never worked because it was real and she represented the feminine and the feminine is in all of us so it's unsquelchable it's who we are (laughs) and she says that we have work to do because our feminine is so underdeveloped and part of their the teaching that she brought through is that we're in this great process, um, which um, she and many people refer to as the ascension process, where we're in the process of ascending to higher dimensions of being, the next one being the fourth dimension. And um, that there's prerequisites for that. And the main prerequisite is this uniting of the masculine and feminine. And she talked about how there's three stages to that. The first stage is balance, bringing the masculine and feminine into balance because we're so out of balance. The masculine has been so developed and uh, predominant in our world, and the feminine has been so underdeveloped and suppressed. So she said, we don't have to bring down the masculine. We just have to strengthen the feminine so that they come into balance. The next one is harmony harmonizing the masculine and feminine. And then the third one is union, uniting the masculine and feminine. And when we get to that place, she says, we'll be ready for transitioning to the next dimension. But right now, most of us are working at the balance phase. (laughs) And she says that strengthening the feminine is all about living in your heart. Mm. And that many, many people have the experience of living in their heart, and they link it to an experience that caused it. Like they mm. fall in love and suddenly their their heart is open. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, something wonderful happens and their heart is open. They're touched by something and their heart is open. But what she says is it's actually a practice that we can practice opening our heart and it really comes from our connection to God as a practice. And that these experiences are moments where we're... Um, being given a glimpse, we're being given a taste of what we could be living in all the time. And in order to do that, in order to be stable and living in our heart, the feminine part of ourselves, as well as our mind, which is the masculine part of ourselves, she says there's three foundations that we have to strengthen and develop. And those three are our relationship to our body, our relationship to our sexuality and energy altogether, but especially sexuality, and our relationship to our emotions, and especially painful emotions for most of us. And if you think about it, these are the three areas that most people have a hard time with in their lives. (laughs) Are their body, their sexuality, and you could expand that to relationships, and emotions. And she said, of these three, the one that is the biggest, that could make the biggest difference for the most people is learning a different way of relating to emotions. And so that's what she really focused on in Mary Magdalene Beckham's is a teaching for what she says our emotions were intended for, which is to take us into union with God, including our painful emotions. And it's a very, as you said, a very simple path but it's a profound practice, largely because most of us have been so trained to immediately suppress our emotions and to go into our minds as a shelter from our emotions. And so we have, it's more in some ways about unlearning the patterns that we've learned and then learning ones that really support us and really help us. Yes. Yes. I remember 
feeling our pain is talking about feeling our pain in the book as something that actually breaks our heart open greater to receive to receive and give love one of the lines um, that she said at one point that i think is so funny and also i dearly love she said do you think that painful emotions were a design error on the part of God? <laughs> Do you think God made a mistake in giving humans these painful emotions? Yes. <laughs> and um, from her point of view, that's the way most of us act. Like, we're not supposed to have these, and the world would be perfect if, it was, if we didn't, you know, or a lot more perfect. But she says, no, that they were actually designed to help us and it's this opening to our heart and through that opening to the divine she also says something that i find quite interesting is that it's also bigger than our personal spiritual path and progress that human beings also have a role a cosmic role relative to the much bigger cosmic picture and that a big part of our role was to be leaders in the emotional domain. If you think about what you've heard or know or seen as far as beings, um, you know, we, we often call them ETs, beings from other places, other planets, other whatever, that they tend to be very non-emotional. They tend to be very developed in their minds, much more so than most humans. Um, but their emotions are very different, absent in a certain way. And that was one thing that humans were supposed to be leaders in. And she says, we are lagging behind right now in our intended role. Yeah, we're, we're rising up in that feminine to meet, to meet where we've been at the masculine. Yes. Um, I had a teacher say once that because so many of us are living in our heads, it's like we're just you know, walking machines, like who's going around in our society. And the head, the brain is not connected to source the way the heart is. Right. And like when we, we can bring our consciousness down into our heart, we're suddenly living our lives and making choices for our planet and ourselves and other people in a totally different way, in a way that is connected to that greater source. The head is connected to source if it's developed in terms of pure consciousness. Mm. It's a different aspect of source. Yeah. The heart is connected to love. It's connected mm. to source made manifest in embodiment. And it, that's the feminine side of source. And consciousness is the masculine side of source. And the two want to work together. That's their nature. Or they're in love with each other. Yeah. But... Um, if we're only in pure consciousness, you know, the transcendental realm, we're away from here. And one of the teachings that Mary and Yeshua, especially Yeshua, is bringing to right now that I just love is that this is what we came for. We came to know embodiment and to know the divine as embodiment, the divine in form. We didn't need to come to know the transcendent. That's where we came from. We came from the transcendent realm. We came here to know the manifest realm. And so this opening to the feminine is what we really, it's our biggest soul work that for all of us. And in some ways we're at the beginning of it. We're still, there's a lot of fear there's a lot of fear about fully opening to it. And you see it in the emotions. What's going to happen if I open to painful emotions? Most of us think we're going to get, they're going to intensify. It's going to get worse. We're going to feel worse. We might get non-functional, dysfunctional. We might even die. We might just get so overwhelmed by the pain that we'll just die. Yeah. And there's something very primal about this, even. It's not it's not a rational thought. It's a primal experience that we actually have to bring our feminine love to, our feminine strength to. 
mm -hmm. and begin to have the experience of going beyond that fear, of opening through the fear and actually finding out what happens. And what Mary says and what I have certainly experienced with myself and with so many others is that it's so different from what we're afraid of, from what we think is going to happen. What's actually hurting us the most is resisting our painful emotions, separating from our painful emotions rather than allowing them and letting and receiving the gift that they want to give us. Yes. Could you lead us through the process that Mary invites us into when we have a difficult emotion? Yes. Um, she says there's actually two pathways. The one pathway is the simple pathway, which is simply to open to the emotion, completely surrender to it, and let it lead you. That's the simple one. For, for most of us, that's the harder one. Most of us, that complete surrender is challenging. So she's given a second path, which is a little more technical, but she says for most of us, easier if we learn how to do this. So I'm going to demonstrate that second one. And the second one begins the same. Well, the first thing is to become aware that you're having a feeling or an emotion, which for a lot of us is a big step because we have um, learned and been trained to jump out of it and avoid it so quickly that we don't even realize we're having a feeling. You know, we're solving it before we are even feeling it. So that's a lot for many of us to slow down enough and become conscious of enough enough of so that we can not do all our defense and just allow the notice that we're actually having a feeling and then the second step from there she says is to open to it to actually invite it in and allow it to the point of merging with it and this is a very feminine step this opening and receiving very feminine, as opposed to protecting ourselves from running away. So when we do that, then she says that we can allow the feeling to take us to its source. And the source of the feeling is not in what was somebody did to us or what happened that we think is the cause out there. The source is actually in us. And what the feeling is pointing to is some part of our God nature. If it's a painful feeling, it's some part of our God nature that we've gotten disconnected from. And that's actually the source of the feeling. And she says the feeling itself will show you which part of your God nature that is. So at this point, what I like to do is give an example. Because if I don't give an example, I think it gets too abstract. So I want to give an example that's a really simple one. But this can be everything from the most simple mundane things in life to the really, really big ones. It works at all levels. But this is a really simple one. So this example is if you're driving and suddenly someone cuts you off and uh, you, f you feel a reaction to that. So the first thing is to notice that you're having a feeling. And again, this is different from what a lot of us do. A lot of us will either go into immediately acting, which in this case might be appropriate. <laughs> you might step on the brake or turn the wheel so you don't have an accident. That might be very you know, helpful as, as far as protecting life. But it might also take you away from the feeling that you're actually having. So, so going after any necessary action you choose to take, then going into the feeling. Um, or you might have a thought come up, and lots of times the immediate thought that comes up is, you know, what a da -da 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 that person is, you know, I can't believe they just did this, you know, haven't they ever heard of, you know, being safe on the road, or, you know, all those thoughts that start <laughs> spiraling. And she said, that's what we've learned to do, that thinking especially is what we've learned to do as a defense against our fear. So she says, if we set that aside to notice what's underneath it, the feeling. And for most of us, there will be a feeling of fear there, that you're actually 
there was some fear about this car cutting you off. And there may be a secondary feeling of um, annoyance, something like that. And she says, okay, so you've identified those feelings. Then let yourself open to it. Let yourself feel the fear. Feel the annoyance. Mm. And again, you know, if you're driving, you might want to, if you really want to do this, you might want to pull over. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, but this is just an example. <laughs> um, but allowing that feeling, which if you think about how many times this has happened to you, and if you've had this kind of response, it's probably fairly rare that you've really gone into the feeling. Our, this, you know, primal fear I was talking about is to defend ourselves from the feeling and go into either action or thinking. So to really feel it for many of us is a new step. And then from there, to let those feelings guide you to the place in you, the God place in you, the beautiful part of yourself that you got disconnected from that that feeling is coming out of. And oftentimes, when there's more than one feeling, each feeling will point you to a different part of your God nature. So in this example, we'll start with the fear. The part that you got disconnected from is probably the part of your God nature that knows the fullness of of safety, of being safe in life. And that is a part of our God being. And ultimately, it's a part of our connection to God, that our true safety is in God. It's not in the events of life. Most of us know in a rational way that nothing in life can ultimately keep us safe. But there is safety in, in a pure, true way in our relationship to God. And what the fear is saying in this particular instance is that you got disconnected from that connection, your divine connection, divine source to that that aspect of your divinity, of safety. Mm -hmm. And the beautiful thing is that just by following the pathway of the feeling, letting it guide you to source, your consciousness is then put on that quality which reconnects you to it. And so it's this amazingly effective process that just through following the pathway will reconnect you to the place you got disconnected from. So then if we look at the other feeling, the feeling of annoyance, that is probably connected to a different part of your inner divinity. And it, it might be something along the lines of um, consideration or cooperation that wasn't fulfilled in this incident and so that you got disconnected from your, your divine lifeline, <laughs> source connection to that aspect of your divinity that knows the purity, the fullness of what it is to be completely um, in cooperation, to be considered. And when you, your consciousness realizes that that's what the feeling is pointing to, again, you can reconnect with that divine aspect of yourself that knows what it is to be fully in cooperation, fully considered. And this doesn't mean that we're not affected by the outside events of life, but they don't cause our feelings. They cause us to get disconnected from our divinity. Mm -hmm. And then when we get disconnected, these feelings show up to help us get reconnected. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) So simple. And then she says there's a last step, which is that when you're reconnected, then you can consider what actions I might like to take from this place, this now reconnected place, as opposed to the previous place of being disconnected. Now that I'm reconnected, what steps, what actions in life might I want to take to support me in staying connected to this place? Mm -hmm. And sometimes... There isn't any additional. What you really needed to do was just reconnect. That was the action. In the driving circumstance, that might be it. 
But in other ones, there definitely are things that you can do. You know, if it's an interpersonal thing with someone, you might have a conversation or you might choose to make a change in your life by seeing this, but you'll be doing it from a different place. You won't be doing it from being disconnected and trying to change the outer events to make you happy. You'll be doing it from your divine source connection and then from that place being in choice about what actions you could take that would strengthen that. Mm. Mm. Is this process for you now? Does it happen pretty seamlessly? And do you notice that it happens more quickly? Oh, yes, very definitely. Yeah. Although, if it's a really big thing that's, you know, stimulating one of my, you know, core soul issues, <laughs> it's not immediate. <laughs> I have to work. I have to practice and engage the practice. And this really is a practice. When I started, um, when I put out the book and I started doing sessions with people, people would come to me and say, oh, I just love this book. It was incredible. It changed my life. And then um, we'd start to work on some area of their life they wanted help with. And I would ask them to apply the process. And I saw that they didn't really know how to, that they had a very intuitive sense that this was really it. But they, but as a practice, they didn't understand how to really make it work for them and apply it in their own life. And so out of that, I started, I created the course that I teach to really teach people the steps of the practice. And I tell people, this is a practice. This is a profound spiritual practice, just like Buddhism. If you wanted to be a Buddhist, it's not enough to read the books and go, gosh, this is the greatest teaching ever. I just really love the Buddha and I have pictures of him all over and just love those teachings. <laughs> but it's not going to change your life, most likely. Yeah. It's that there's a very core practice being taught and you need to engage it. And this is the same way. It's a more feminine style practice, which I love for men and women because we all have our feminine. But um, it really is a practice and to the degree people practice it, that's the degree it will be available for them in life and will transform them. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the direct experience. Mm -hmm. Direct experience and the choice, the mm -hmm. choice to engage it as it doesn't just happen to you. Mm -hmm. You have to bring your will and your, um, your energy and your skill to doing this. Yes. Well, one question I wanted to ask is just, just in this more general sense of what you see happening in the world right now and of this feminine rising and what we see happening in both men and women and, and also younger generations. And I think more and more people being born at this time coming in with greater consciousness. And mm -hmm. actually, I think of how powerful this practice is, especially for mothers, like for a mother to teach a child this practice from a, the very beginning. You so, so true. <laughs> I work with so many people who are either mothers and they're really, you know, wanting to know. And there's this can be learned by a child from birth. And it's the strongest way. We all learned a way to relate to our emotions from birth. So the best thing is to learn this way rather than <laughs> what most of us learn that we have to unlearn and then, you know, replace it. Yeah. And um, so I love working with mothers, especially because that's our future, you know. Yeah. Um, I also hear from mothers who are whose children are grown that they're so sad that they didn't have this when they were raised. Mm -hmm children that they yeah. so would have loved that but then they realize well I can start now I can do yes. this now and that's absolutely true but relative to what I see in our world I am so excited about mm -hmm. what's happening now just incredibly excited and just one example that is a powerful example is um, the Me Too movement yeah. uh, because it definitely has to do with the empowerment of women and women finding their voice and um, and their power to express their reality, even in the face of a lot of resistance. 
Um, and then I was following uh, very, very closely. I was so interested in the response of men to this. And initially what I heard was a lot of defensiveness. And, um, and then after that wave kind of subsided, what I'm starting to hear is a lot of openness on the part of men. And, you know, acknowledging that there was that defensiveness initially and now like we men really have to look at what we've done and what i'm so excited about is the conversations about uh, the the men that i hear talking about what shaped them to be the way that they were raised and their training as boys and how they want to be different with their sons and specifically talking about the effect it's had that they were trained not to be emotional and to never, you know, acknowledge that they had pain, that they had fear, that they had sadness, that they cried and, you know, that they were told be a man, you know, grow some balls, all that kind of training that was essentially about, you know, don't have, deny your feminine, don't show any part of your feminine nature. And this is the result that we have, you know, this culture that, has been the case up till now. And, um, but I see this huge wave of awakening of women and men awakening together in different ways. And of course, there's a whole spectrum. And like I said, we all have the feminine, we all have the masculine. But um, there's so many signs in the world of openness to this and change that I am just thrilled about. <laughs> me too <laughs> it's wonderful to see people yeah waking up to these realities and men opening up something that i've started to see a lot more it's still it's still like getting there but there are a lot of women circles where i live but i do know some men now starting to circle and um be vulnerable with each other and share their feelings. It's really and needed. The rate of change in terms of the big picture of, you know, humanity and how quickly it's happening is just incredible. Yeah. You know, it might seem slow to us as we're living through it yeah. <laughs> and how much we would like it to be different, <laughs> mm -hmm. but it's amazing. Yes. Oh. Oh, well, I wanted to ask you about France and just your experiences going to France and actually being in the places where Mary Magdalene is connected to. Um, I, I haven't yet done a pilgrimage, and I see that in the future one day, and I would just love to hear. And I know of some other women, too, that are feeling that call, so I want to hear your experiences of it. Absolutely. I adore France. And I feel Mary there so strongly in so many places. And uh, I've even been told by people who work with me that they see a change in me when I'm in France, that I actually, there's a, a different quality that even comes through in me while I'm there. And um, it's just incredible to be connected to her very directly in that way. And I feel so blessed that I have been able to uh, lead groups of women going over there and that we uh, engage this practice together. Part of the prerequisite when I lead the groups is that everyone um, learns this, mag what we call the Magdalene Heart Path, this practice of opening our hearts through opening our emotions. And we engage that together and we go to these different sites and do ceremony together and we actually do a Magdalene Heart Initiation in France, and it is just magnificent. It's so mm -hmm. beautiful. So I'm really looking forward to going back. I'm not going to be leading a group this year, but planning in 2019, I will be. And I also am looking at um, the possibility that I may in the future be leading um groups in Egypt also, which is wow. another place I feel such a connection to through the Temple of Isis. And I believe, and Mary's told me that she was a high priestess in the Temple of Isis. And um, I'm looking forward to that a lot too. Yes, these sacred sites are these portals where we can 
deep in our connection. I too have been feeling that if like I have some friends, you know, I can see there are different lineages they feel connected to. I have one friend who's very much in the Celtic uh, kind of tradition and really wants to go to Ireland. And I have another friend who I feel like could be more of like a star seed and like from another planet kind of connection. And for me, like that, that connection to Egypt or to France, it's like, ah, that's, you know, my heart quickens at those thoughts. It's really interesting. I imagine it must be past life connections yes, so when we feel that way. I certainly felt it for myself. When I went to France for the very first time, I felt I was home. And mm. I remember walking in the forest and going, this is the forest I've always been looking for. This is what I always knew a forest should be like. But I had never seen it in my life before I got to France. And mm. I felt that way everywhere I went. This is so familiar. This is home. I'm home. Yeah. Wow. Well, I wanted to ask you another question, too, about um, being an author and I actually published a book last year as well. And it was, <laughs> thank you. And it was a memoir actually of my travels through India, which was from when six years ago, a trip that um, I had taken that was really life changing. And, and it was, uh, there were aspects that were vulnerable of sharing so much of myself and <laughs> letting, you know, putting that out there and my family reading it and all these, you know, I just wanted to ask about your experience with that and especially with um, the second book, which is all about Tantra. And what, what was your experience? Yeah. Well, Mary Magdalene was so clear. She said, the world does not need another book of instruction on Tantra. <laughs> There's plenty of books out there. And of course, you know, there might be some, you know, parts that are slightly different that, you know, this book would be bringing forth, but she said, fundamentally, that's not what's needed. She said, but the ones who are living this, who are experiencing this, haven't told their stories for that reason, because it's so vulnerable to put it out there. But she said, this is what people need more than anything, because people read these books on Tantra, and they're like, oh, this is great. I really want to do this. How do I begin? And what does this look like in life? You know, how do real people do this? Yeah. And she said, that's what people really want to hear. So she was very clear that it was the the most important part was me telling my story. So I said, okay, <laughs> I accept the mission. <laughs> and then I remember when I had finished the book and I was getting ready to publish it, being nervous. And I said to one of my friends, well, I think I've ruined myself for relationship with this book. <laughs> no one will ever want to be in relationship with me ever. <laughs> <laughs> I've shared all this stuff. <laughs> and she said, no. She said, you just set the bar high. That's <laughs> but um, I just let go of it. And I just, like so much of this, I, I trust. And I believe that the people who are guided through these books who need it, will be the ones who will read it and they'll understand. And I've heard from so many people that they're so grateful for me sharing my story and it has made such a difference. And, you know, that's awesome to hear. I, there's one funny story. There was, um, my books are for sale on Amazon and I have many reviews and I'm very blessed that most of them are five star and some four star. And there was one review early on that was like, the worst review I got on Mary Magdalene Beckins. And this woman had like just nothing good to say. She thought I was deluded. I was full of myself. I was claiming that I was uh, a priestess in a past life, that, you know, what hippie rock was I crawling out from under? She just went on and on. I couldn't even, she gave me two stars. I couldn't even believe she gave me that much. <sighs> and then later I found out that Amazon has this system where they have, um, reviewers that they pay and they assign books for them to review and this woman was assigned to read my book and oh. she had no connection to it whatsoever and I, I don't even know if she actually read it because she must have been so allergic to it but yeah. that's not the people who in general <laughs> read my books the ones who read it and are drawn to it are the ones where they're ready it has something for them that's of value and that's wonderful yeah 
I love that. Just letting go and trusting that <laughs> this will reach the people it needs to reach. And, you know, it'll be an allergy to some people, but that's okay too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was another thing when I was first like a new author and I was learning about how to market. And one of the things that I learned was that controversy can be good. That can stir yeah. up some interest and people will, you know, people will have strong opinions and some of those will probably be that they think you're wrong or they don't like you, but some of the people will, you know, be drawn to listen to you and hear you and be open. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think I remember when I, in the very beginning of my podcast, getting a, um, a review from someone who was like, she was only just commenting on the, on how my voice sounded, you know, like nothing about the content of what the podcast was, but it was just like this whole thing about, <laughs> I was just like, wow, okay. Just, you know, <laughs> triggering at first, but then it's like, okay, let's let that go. And <laughs> focus on reaching the people who really need the information. Right. Yeah. Um, so one question, I'm curious just about your past few months or year, what would you say if you feel open to sharing it has been a challenge in your life and how have you been overcoming that? Well, I was very sick um, this past winter for most of three months and that was really challenging and I started letting go of things. And um, that was when I, I had planned on leaving the France trip this summer, and I let go of that. And then I started letting go of other things that I was teaching, and it was really scary for me to do that. Mm -hmm. It was um, what you might think of as a mini death process of what I thought was going to be my life, what I thought was going to be my work. And I'm seeing that, again, spirit has other plans for me, and it's out perfectly but that uh, it's interesting because a lot of people have told me in the past when they hear my story about leaving Hawaii and following spirit they say you are so courageous and I never thought of myself as courageous I thought of myself as maybe intelligent because I had learned from the past you know and was applying that in my life it didn't seem like it was courage. It just seemed like the smart thing to do. Spirit had always worked out for the best, and so, of course, I was going to follow spirit. But I think people were projecting what it would take for them to do what I had done, and they were imagining it would take a lot of courage. But that wasn't really what I felt. But this year was different for me. This year, I was resistive. I... Um, had things that I wanted to accomplish. I have books. I have so many books that I want to be writing. <laughs> and um, even the book that I thought was going to be the next book has completely changed. Now I'm working on a new book, uh, which I'm quite excited about. And um, so it, it was another level of letting go and a spirit working with me. And for me, I don't even need to understand. I don't even need to understand, well, why was this harder than something else? It doesn't matter. <laughs> it just was. To me, that's a diversion. I don't even need to give energy to it. It's just, I trust spirit. It's working on me. I came up with resistance, just like when I had the initial resistance in my throat. It's the same thing. What do I need to do to let go of this? Mm. Yeah, sometimes we get put in a totally new direction, different. Th yeah, there's this, that joke, if you want to make God laugh, make a plan. Or the version that I really love is, <laughs> you want to make God laugh, tell her your plans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to ask you if you would be open to tuning in to Mary Magdalene even right now and just seeing if she has any messages for me or for anyone listening um, in this time. Hmm. Yep, she's right here. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like me to channel and you want me to bring forth her voice? Sure. Greetings, beloveds. This is Mary Magdalene. I'm so happy to be here with you. The thing that I would most like to share with you in a very concise, simple way 
is that this is such a powerful and important time for the feminine. And that you are coming into your power, and especially those of you who are the upcoming generations, I trust you tremendously and the power that you are connecting with. It is important that you also know that do not emulate the masculine form of power. This is not about you becoming in power over or specifically power over the masculine. The feminine form of power is the power of love. And of course, this will be unique in each situation, how this manifests in its highest form. But in general, it is not the same as the masculine form of power. And most of you are quite strong in your masculine form of power already because your society has so favored the masculine, whether you were a girl, boy, man, woman, you all are very tending to be coming from your masculine side. So even the women have a strong tendency to bring their power in the masculine form. And what I urge you to do is to learn the feminine form, to become strong in the feminine form of power, the form of love, and especially love of the masculine. And that this is supported by the work of becoming strong in your bodies, in your sexuality, in your emotions. And then uniting your feminine with your masculine. First the internal, and then of course it will happen in the external, in your relationships, in your world. But this is what I most wish to communicate. There is no point in becoming strong in the feminine if it is simply to become strong as a form of separation. Become strong to love. And be a lover of the masculine. Not so that either one can overpower the other. So that you can know the bliss of this balance and harmony and union that is your true nature. This is what I wish for all. Thank you so much, Mary, for sharing your love with us in this form. Mm. Thank you to Mary. <laughs> It's beautiful. Well, I would love to just invite in um, how people can stay connected with you and anything that you're excited about in your business now. Um, yeah. Certainly. Um, well, first, it's I invite people to go to my website where there's a wealth of information, and that is mercedeskirkle.com. M-E-R-C-E-D-E-S-K-I-R-K-E-L dot com. And you'll see all the things that I offer there. Um, you can join my newsletter. And um, when one of the changes, it used to come out weekly, but that was one of the things they said I needed to let go of. So now it comes out periodically. <laughs> and... Um, when it does, I share a channeling from Mary or from Yeshua. So you can um, have access to the channelings through that. Um, you can read the books, the first two books that were brought through. The first one, Mary Magdalene Beckins, is especially her teaching on strengthening the feminine and uniting the feminine and masculine. And the second one, Sublime Union on Sacred Sexuality. And hopefully soon, maybe even by the end of this year, there will be a third one, which is an amazing dialogue that ha I'm channeling between Yeshua and a former priest, where this former priest is asking Yeshua all his questions that he has about 
the Bible, the church, the third dimension, and it's an amazing thing that's happening. Mm -hmm. So that one is forthcoming. And then I also offer online classes. Um, I offer the basic Magdalene Heart Path class, a six-week class. I offer a year-long program for um, awakening and activating the light body, leading to connecting with the fourth dimension and learning to manifest in the fourth dimensional way. Um, and I also am leading advanced courses, so many different online courses available. And then there's my in-person retreats, such as the France Retreat. Um, I'm hoping that uh, in the next year that I will be starting up leading Sacred Sexuality Retreats again. And um, retreats that are about um, activating the Magdalene Yeshua love in all of us. Mm. So those are the offerings that I love to share with people, and I hope you'll all come to my website, again, MercedesKirkle.com, and explore and see what's right for you. Mm -hmm. oh, well, thank you so much for doing this work in the world and sharing and helping others awaken to these teachings and the balance of the feminine and the masculine within themselves. Um, I'd love to just close this time with a short prayer and let's just invite ourselves back into our breath, into this moment, into our gratitude, into these teachings. I invite any, everyone listening to just whatever it is that really touched you today. Bring that into your heart, whether it be an opening of what it may be like to fully feel your emotions, learn from them. It means to have the feminine rise within you to find balance with the masculine. What Mary Magdalene means to you in your life. Invite us into this opening, this deepening, this connection with our bodies, our emotions, our sexuality. And finding that divine balance within ourselves to restore balance in our world. So I'll bring my hands to my heart, just bowing with gratitude to Mercedes for sharing her wisdom. And to all of you listening for doing your sacred work. And bowing, of course, to Mary Magdalene, gracing us with her presence today. Amen. Aho. Blessed be. so much for taking the time to listen to our show today we would love to hear what you think take a moment to hop on over to itunes and leave us a review we'd be so grateful to receive it until next time namaste